Glory to Jesus Christ, glory forever. Okay, welcome back everybody to our study of the Evergetinos. And if you remember last week, we actually got through an entire hypothesis. And uh, so we're picking up with the new one this evening, uh, hypothesis 31, starting on page 261. And we've been talking about the ascetic life and how it is that one begins to take that up. And uh, the author here, the compiler, uh, begins to focus upon the embrace of the ascetic life as a prelude to greater commitment. And so he's emphasizing here in this hypothesis and the next, the importance of entering into a period of trial, of testing uh, in the ascetic life in order to prepare to enter into the monastic life and as it were, to take upon oneself a greater role, a greater commitment in terms of the life of prayer itself. And, uh, and so it's as if this period of time would be akin to something like betrothal. And uh, one would enter into the ascetic life to prepare the mind and the heart, uh, to free oneself of the passions in order that one might make a greater commitment to the Lord, withholding absolutely nothing from him. And so embracing the life in a very deep way, commitment to, to the life of prayer, perhaps a commitment to a life of, of greater solitude, but certainly to the life of greater prayer, taking upon oneself the responsibility for the chanting and praying of the Psalms and, uh, with a kind of depth uh, there that requires great commitment to a kind of unceasing prayer. And uh, so it's interesting. I think it lays out something very important for us. Uh, whatever our state in life is, that we enter into the ascetic life, uh, not as an end in itself, but something that leads us more deeply into the life, uh, life in Christ, into this deep unity with him. And so it is something that is to be continually deepening throughout the course of one's life. And uh, because the, the greater the commitment and the deeper our prayer becomes, also the, the more fierce the attacks become upon us spiritually. And so there has to be uh, almost a greater vigilance that grows over the course of time. And, uh, and so we see through the, these two hypotheses, I think, again, the centrality of the ascetical life uh, as part of, of the spiritual life as a whole, and that outside of it, it's, it's hard to conceptualize the spiritual life at all, that there is no spiritual life without engaging in a life of deep prayer, of overcoming the passions, of developing this watchfulness of, of heart. Uh, and so it emphasizes everything, you know, certainly that I think is important, whatever our state in life might be, we would want to be engaging in the ascetic life that is appropriate to it. So again, hypothesis 31 to on page 261 of the text. From the life of St. Ionikios. When the wondrous Ionikios was in the 12th year of his sojourn in the desert, a revelation came to him from heaven through which he was called to withdraw from that place and set up a hut at the hermitage of Ariste, and at the same time to assume monastic garb, for he had already given himself to great struggles before he had put on the monastic schema. Although such struggles, great and remarkable as they were, were but preparatory exercises. So even before taking upon himself the monastic habit, uh, sort of this outward sign of one's uh, complete commitment to God, that for 12 years he had lived uh, an eremitic life, uh, a life of great discipline, uh, before uh, being called on to something greater. And uh, I think this is important, you know, especially when we consider our call to a particular vocation, you know, whether it's married life, single life, or uh, to the priesthood, that this period of preparation of mind and heart, you know, to move from the, the, the mind 
the thoughts, uh, the idea of like a priestly vocation or a monastic vocation to the lived reality, the praxis, and to move from the notional to the real is something that is uh, essential, that we can have it in our mind uh, that we're called to a particular vocation. There might be something that's attractive about it on many different levels, but until one is uh, engaged in the life, until one begins to take it up and the discipline that is associated with it, uh, that it remains an idea, not, not a lived reality. And so often you know, over the years, I found myself telling uh, young men and women to place the thought of a particular vocation on the back burner, not in the sense of ignoring it or never thinking about, about it, but when the idea comes uh, to the surface, not to focus upon it or become enamored with the idea, but embrace something of the lifestyle, begin to live something of the life of a religious or a priest in terms of the ascetic life that it's Christ himself that says, says, come follow me. And so whatever path that we are uh, considering taking, that we would want to prepare the mind and the heart, that we would be able to hear that call and be responding to, to him rather than simply to what is attractive to us on some level. So Ionikios uh, takes the monastic garb. During the summer, he arrived at the hermitage indicated to him by God and confided in Stephen, the abbot of the monks there, the things that God had revealed to him. Without hesitation, Stephen clothed him in the monastic garb the following day after performing the customary prayers and ceremonies of the monastic tonsure. Having been clothed in the monastic schema, then he who had been a monastic even before taking the schema threw himself into greater struggles than the previous ones and devoted himself to a more arduous asceticism. So it's a curious thing that there had to be something so genuine in the presentation of uh, Ionikios to the abbot Stephen something so genuine about this young man's uh, pers personality, the, how he expressed the particular call to the monastic life that would lead the abbot to tonsure him and to clothe him so quickly within the, the monastic garb, uh, that he had obviously embraced the ascetic life so deeply that the abbot felt that he was able then to embrace the greater asceticism, uh, that taking upon himself the role of life that would go along with being clothed in the habit. Anything from this first section? Anybody have any comments or thoughts? Okay. From the life of St. Olypios. The reputation of Olypios the Great had made him well known everywhere. And for this reason, many people went to visit him, not only men, but also women who had decided to follow the way of repentance. Since those who came were not few in number, he built two houses, each far from the other, in which he divided the sexes, that is, separating the men from the women, though not the spirits of those practicing asceticism. To the women ascetics, he gave the role and the commandment that they should never appear before men and should not even behold them. So much did those holy women heed and respect this commandment, that the saint himself often urged them to see their parents in exceptional instances or at death. They chose not to, wishing in this way to demonstrate that the commandment of their spiritual father was stronger even than this natural urge. And so we see here, you know, within early monasticism, uh, the kind of urgency and in, in the call and this response, but fervor and zeal and the association with those who are living it in a very deep level can be in, uh, infectious, as it were. You know, that uh, when one is surrounded by those who have this deep desire and longing for the Lord, it can set the hearts of others on fire as well. And this is what we see in the early uh, life of monasticism, this uh, uh, great desire to serve the Lord and people flooding into the desert to embrace this kind of lifestyle. 
both men and women, as we see here. Among the holy women dwelled the mother of St. Olympias. She practiced the same role as the others, but she could not be persuaded to receive the monastic schema, even though her virtue was certainly remarkable, as we said in another place. She constantly refused to obey the many persistent entreaties of her son, maintaining that in the monastery, the servant is the same as the nun. However, it happened that a divine dream brought her into immediate obedience to her son's entreaty, so that she now began to beg him fervently in this regard. It seemed to her in this revealing dream that she was hearing certain holy women chanting in melodious psalmody. She was so delighted by this chanting that she wanted to enter the room where this wonderful choir was singing and to be united herself with the chanting women. But when she tried to enter, a guard prevented her saying, she who is not wearing the same schema as the servants of God may not communicate with them. After this vision, the mother of the saint was ashamed and perturbed, and she immediately woke up and without delay ran to the saint, recounted her dream, and persistently requested to receive that which she had with same, the same intensity previously refused. In this way, she thus took the same schema as the others, whom she had long resembled in her way of life and asceticism. And having sown many plants of virtue, she now reaps with gladness the incorruptible fruits of heaven. So there is something here that's being unfolded for us, and it's the nature of commitment itself, that the ascetic life is part of, uh, uh, of the spiritual life and an essential part of it, uh, but it leads to a particular end in regards to committing oneself to the Lord in a deeper and deeper fashion. And so for whatever reasons there were, you know, or feeling that in some sense that she wanted to make herself the servant of the nuns or that she had embraced the ascetic life on a certain level and that it wasn't something that was necessary for her. And then through the dream, she begins to see that there is something greater to which she's being called to. And part of it is made manifest in terms of the life that they led, which was this constant chanting of the, the psalmody and the, the beauty of that. But it's really the commitment and the constant commitment to prayer and the role uh, that is associated with that, like binding oneself uh, in a concrete way to a particular way of life uh, in an irrevocable fashion. And so we begin to see here emerging uh, something of the nature of the vowed life, this commitment to a specific way of life uh, and in a concrete way, binding oneself to, to God. And uh, that there is something very powerful uh, about this. And I think when we look at our life as a whole, that when we do make specific commitments, uh, that uh, it can be something that uh, draws us into a, a greater life of holiness, a willingness to make self-sacrifice, self not to be driven alone by uh, one's emotions, or thoughts, ideas, but simply by the commitment to the Lord uh, in and through the particular path that he's called us to walk. And uh, I think all of us have probably experienced how difficult it can be simply on the spiritual life, in the spiritual life as a whole, to remain committed to God in the life of prayer, uh, even when we make a specific and conscious and concrete role for ourselves and hold a bonding for ourselves, it can be a strain uh, to hold fast to it. And, uh, and certainly, I think in any relationship too, whether it's in marriage or uh, to a religious community or to the priesthood, uh, that often it is that, that vow where one is setting aside one's will in a way that one is conformed to Christ in a very deep way that is transformative. And uh, 
And this is what we see them seeking in their life, to be conformed more and more to Christ in their dying to self and dying to sin and to live to, for Christ alone. And what we, we see, uh, we'll see unfold here and this hypothesis and the next is that it all becomes pointless if one embraces that life, you know, takes upon oneself the monastic garb and one isn't living it that uh, one uh, in taking upon oneself that commitment uh, it's to then give shape to one's life uh, as being focused upon Christ fully. And, uh, and so there has to be this constant movement uh, toward God, a deepening of that desire and longing for him that uh, takes place through the commitment uh, otherwise, uh, and they'll be very direct about this, it can bring a, a certain level of shame upon us. And in the sense that, you know, others see the commitment being made, but if we are not living it, uh, even though, uh, you know, people are sort of saying, uh, look at this person who's committed themselves to the Lord, that uh, the praise is received undeservedly. And this brings upon us a kind of shame uh, before the eyes of God. And so they are really cautious about uh, someone entering into this prematurely without having been tested in the ascetic life. And I think, again, you know, whatever path we take in life, this is something important for us. Uh, when we are thinking about making any kind of commitment, whether in marriage, religious life, or priesthood, that there be a longer period of preparing the mind and the heart through the ascetic life. Uh, so often, you know, the decision to embrace a particular vocation uh, sometimes takes place at a very young age. In fact, older people are often sort of discouraged from embracing the the life after they are, they're like 35 years you're pretty much uh red flagged in regards to any religious community or the priesthood that and what we see though within the writings of the fathers is a kind of different wisdom it's really what uh, uh has taken place within the heart over the course of time that should determine not age alone uh in one way or another you know it's one should not be pressed into the religious life nor simply because one has gray hair does one think that they're well suited it's really the formation of the mind and the heart that is most important and we can't have this sort of cookie cutter image of what you know a priest or a religious should look like it should be really somebody's response to god and certainly all of our readings have shown us the great variety of individuals that God has called, sometimes from very dissolute lives into great holiness. Okay, any thoughts or comments? Uh, Bridget McGinley writes, uh, Juan Diego was 57 with no children when Our Lady appeared to him. He was not a religious, just a beautiful soul doing his simple duty. Very humble example for me. Right, you know, 57. I'm 57, <laughs> so it's not too late for me. Uh, but yes, you know, I, I think it is the you know humility of heart, the desire for God that is most important here. And uh, so, with even with the emphasis on the ascetic life and on embracing the monastic garb, I think what what the fathers are always looking for is the kind of purity of heart that is necessary to give oneself to God fully. From the Durant Khan. An elder said, children, believe me when I tell you that however great the praise and glory that belong to a king who abandons his kingdom and becomes a monk, as great is the shame for a monk who spurns the monastic schema and becomes a king. And this because noetic things are incomparably more precious than sensible things. And so, you know, to leave the world to embrace uh, 
uh, the religious life or a life dedicated to God is greater, certainly, than a person who leaves the spiritual life to embrace something worldly. That we want to be clear in our minds and our heart what, what is of greatest value, what's the pearl of great price, what it is that we as human beings should desire the most. And that is what should shape our life. Again, whatever station in life and whatever path we take, it still should be the desire for God that you know gives shape to that and form to it. There was once a great clairvoyant elder who maintained that the power of grace, which he saw during a baptism, near at hand to the person being baptized. He also saw at the time when a monk was receiving the angelic schema. So, you know, what we see, again, taking shape here is that they begin to see a kind of sacramental grace being bestowed upon an individual in making this commitment of binding oneself, of giving oneself over to God, completely and withholding nothing that really what is it the shape of you know taking uh we'll see a distinction that is made between sort of a, a lesser schema and the great schema uh l- later on in the next hypothesis but uh it really involves the cross the death to self self-will and living for god alone desiring him alone and uh, so very early on here, we begin to see the monks talking about it in such a way that there is a particular grace that comes through it. And so even though it's not uh, and has not and has never been uh, considered one of the sacraments uh, of, of the church, that there is this sense that uh, that there is great grace that comes through it. And uh, you know, wh- whether one's in a monastic community or not, I think it's the commitment to God that brings this flood of grace that is comparable uh, to something such as baptism in the vision of these monks. And uh, I think it's clear enough for us to understand you know, when one holds nothing back from God, then God holds nothing back from the soul that there is this outpouring of God's grace uh, that one experiences. Anthony. This paragraph reminds me of Luther or Lutherdom by Father Denefil. Luther took concepts like this way out of context and with the current of depravity among religious in the late Middle Ages, great harm came to the church. Yes, you know, that's interesting, because in the, the next hypothesis, or it might even be this hypothesis, he, the authors speak of the particular scandal of those who embrace the life, but do not act in accord with the dignity of it, and the, uh, with the nature of the high calling, that uh, to pretend, as it were, that one is living this life completely given over to God, has no value whatsoever. And it simply brings shame to the person, but scandal in the life of the church. And look at this individual who has made this profession, but isn't living it in reality. And certainly we know in our own time, you know, what damage that that causes as well. And, uh, you know, the depravity, as you mentioned, of among religious, you know, often has been in different generations, uh, something that's diminished uh, the capacity of the church to evangelize and uh, has really brought great harm, you know, for generations to come. And in our own day, I think we've seen it in a terrible fashion. And, uh, you know, what what can bring recovery from this? And I think it's, you know, only God and his providence that will bring it about you know what will purify the pre- not only the priesthood but i think the the church as a whole in terms of bearing witness to the gospel in its fullness and uh i think god only knows i think often it has been in different times persecution 
in some way where people are uh, compelled to, to uh, search their hearts and ask what it is that they love the most or to what they're, they've really given their heart over to. Uh, Father? Mm -hmm. Yes. Even more than that, what he seems to have done, if I get the book right, is he took this idea of like a second baptism and he made it what you said it wasn't, that it was some kind of a sacrament and he took it so seriously and the monks were so disposed to throw it all off anyway because right. of the hardness of their hearts. It was just... Right. Was just, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting that, you know, there can be you know, a kind of fierceness in terms of the way that the life is lived and, and zeal, but it can be misdirected or there can be a lack of understanding that leads it all to crumble in any case. And, uh, and you know, I think we see, can see that in religious communities, how quickly they can shift from something that seems very uh, powerful or fruitful and there can be a kind of distortion that enters into it. And then what seems to be good or started out very good does not persevere or becomes very destructive over the course of time. And so in the coming paragraphs, we find, you know, warning after warning that, you know, this can't be something in the mind or it can't be something that we try to pretend to live, you know, to cloak ourselves in this idea or image, it has to be rooted in uh, this great love and desire for God. And, you know, I brought this up so many times, how, how much the language of desire is a part of the language of, of the saints and, and especially of the Desert Fathers. You know, that uh, this longing and desire, this urgent longing for God is what is to guide the ascetic life. You know, without that end in mind, without this longing that is very personal, then it is not something that perseveres or bears fruit. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, from St. Ephraim the Syrian. Among all the writers within this first volume of the, of the Evergatinos, St. Ephraim, there's always something rich in every sentence. Uh, there's the Syriac writers are just uh, incredible. He and Isaac in particular. And so he never disappoints. My brother, be not impatient to receive the angelic schema. For the enemy implants in some people the unreasonable desire to demand the mask schema when the time is not yet ripe by reason of age. But as for you, my beloved, as long as you want to please God, be patient, hear what the apostle says. If thou mayest be made free, use slavery rather. Cast your gaze over the past generations and see that all the saints receive promises from God with forbearance and patience. And goad yourself daily to be a fellow heir with them one day in the kingdom of heaven. So. You know, through Ephraim here, the compiler is beginning to lead us into uh, the deeper reason uh, behind the ascetic life. And it is this imitation of the saints and holding within ourselves the same desire that they had for God and having a kind of patience to allow God and his providence to give shape to that life that one cannot willful, be willful in the pursuit of the, the religious life, uh, but uh, allow God to reveal what the nature of it is to the soul and then to begin to perfect and purify the heart in order that one might give oneself over without any impediment. And again, I think this is true for Christians as a whole, uh, that to wait upon the Lord, to allow him to reveal to us through giving us light for one step at a time, uh, the path that leads to holiness and sanctification, not to be willful in the path that we, we take moving forward. 
Ephraim continues, have you considered that the patriarch Jacob worked as a slave in Mesopotamia for 14 years next to Laban the Syrian and during the, and, and during the heat of the day and the frost of the night for the sake of Rachel? Likewise, did not the beloved Joseph remain for several years as a slave in a foreign country? In this regard, scripture says Joseph was 17 years old, feeding the sheep with his brethren. Later on, it says Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Moses, the servant of the Lord, remained as a refugee in the land of Midian for 40 years. The Hebrews entered into the promised land after a journey of 40 years. Prior to all of this, think how many years it was before Abraham received what had been promised to him by God. In general, all the saints gained the divine promises through ungrudging waiting, waiting then patiently on the Lord, and he will exalt you when the opportunity comes and will present your virtue as light and the judgment will shine for you as the sun shines at midday. So important. Again, you know, Ephraim is one of the most beautiful of, of writers, that this willingness on our part to wait upon the Lord to show us the path forward and to enter into the life that has been given to us, even if it is humbling, like all, all these individuals serving as a slave or living in a kind of hardship uh, for long periods of their life until uh, the path that God has set before them begins to emerge. Uh, it's interesting, you know, psychology will often talk about, you know, a person going through a, a second adolescence, not a midlife crisis, but this kind of second adolescence when one begins to sort of, after having gone through so many years or decades of their life, begins to, they sort of turn and shift and take hold of a particular path that is set before them that has arisen out of their experience of life. And so from on a purely emotional level, there is this, you know, vision that you know one makes a choice to pursue that which is more deeply fulfilling after having experienced a certain and a significant amount of one's life uh, that uh, a newer path can begin to emerge now of course that can be adolescent in the worst way <laughs> you know uh, priests could go out and buy a you know a sports car or something like that and a convertible but or or, or leave his vocation altogether, or uh, there can be a, a deepening, a clarifying of, of moving in a direction that God has laid open over the course of the, of the years, has led an individual to see certain things about the path that God wants them to walk and that is going to bring about greater sanctification, uh, or lead them to serve in a way that in the earlier years of their life, they would never have imagined or been able to conceive of. And certainly all the individuals mentioned here, Jacob, uh, Moses, Joseph, you know, I don't imagine any of them imagined, thought that their path would take them uh, where it did. And yet this is the kind of, uh, of life that we are to embrace this ungrate he says ungrudging waiting uh it is then when we're willing to do this that the lord will lift us up exalt us allow us to see what we need to see and you know i don't think this is an easy path at all you know the, it requires a, a deep prayerfulness a willingness to uh, open ourselves to God, allow ourselves to be shaped by the experiences of life that sometimes can be very difficult and that we don't understand. Uh, I was reading a little quote from St. John Kronstadt uh, today where he talks about how we can often see even our body as our own rather than the temple of God. 
And so when we experience illness, we often will murmur to ourselves, ah, you know, it's like, I can't stand this, you know, my, you know, my body has betrayed me kind of thing. And, you know, St. John Cronstadt says, you know, we should not be belly aching about this, that there is a kind of spirit that we are called to embrace uh, this kind of cross that might come to us and uh, wait to see what God reveals to us in and through it. You know, maybe he's telling us to slow down, or maybe there's something that we need to see in that, or maybe uh, the, the feebleness that we experience on a physical level reveals to us some kind of feebleness on a spiritual level that we need to be attentive to as well. And uh, so there, there's a deep and subtle wisdom that comes through the fathers, in particular Ephraim, and everything that he's talking about. And he's talking here about what we precisely what we are not willing to do, especially in our day and age, with ungrudging waiting. Nobody wants to wait for anything. <clears throat> if again, you have been deemed worthy to receive the holy clothing of the monk, do not give yourself over to heirs to the detriment of those who have waited to become monks of the great schema the following year. It is not a virtue for someone to think that he is first, but rather to endure temptations unto the end. Do not therefore say to yourself when you have received the monastic great schema, now I have been delivered from sin. It would be preferable for you to toil from this moment even more greatly for the virtues lest you cause yourself excessive harm. For many times up to now, and out of a desire for the greater schema, you did not neglect your salvation. Up to now, you were in the outer vault, but now you have entered the inner vault. And so, you know, there's a real danger here in, in not waiting upon the Lord and his particular call. If we, in our minds, uh, jump to something prematurely, then we can lose something that is precious, which is that longing for God, thinking that somehow, okay, if I make this commitment, I'm going to be preserved from something, rather than in and through the commitment, being able to give oneself over to God more fully, and to engage in the spiritual battle more fiercely. And so to take upon oneself the great schema is not uh, a prize, let's put it that way. It, you know, it's not uh, given to one to make their life easier. It's a commitment to God to withhold nothing. And it most likely means that the spiritual battle will become more fierce. But to, to take it upon oneself, to put on airs, as he says, is a detriment to all those who wait to take it upon themselves and engage in the ascetic life for someone to seize hold of it. And, you know, this tells us a lot of different things, too, in regards to how we approach so many different things in the spiritual life. Re receiving Holy Communion being a big one, you know, that we receive it in this spirit of gratitude with minds and hearts prepared not seize upon it as something that is owed to us you know for you know our own sake or as if we've earned it in some form or fashion that we want it to be a response uh, to god's call and filled with a desire for him and also with the grace provides us in receiving it but if we seize it in you know as if it were a kind of commodity uh, in a consumeristic kind of way then what kind of fruit is that going to bear within us and what what kind of example does it offer to others if we are receiving without really any attentiveness to the reality of what's going on within our heart it should be clear from now on exactly which way you strongly desire, the broad and spacious one, which leads to perdition, or the narrow and arduous one, which leads to eternal life. Do not then be negligent about your soul, lest you lose those things for which you have labored. 
You should never desire to come out of your cell without your mantle, even if it involves some pressing task, but wrap it around yourself and come out in this manner. For it is shameful for a monk to walk around as a young man with only a leviton or a tunic. For scripture says, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. So, you know, the, a true desire for God and the desire to walk the narrow path is one, means that one is going to hold, embrace that identity and hold on to it at every single moment. And this is why Ephraim emphasizes then, you know, the, the putting on of the, of the, of the habit itself, the, the, the great schema that they would wear, uh, not to go out without it. Uh, because it becomes this concrete and tangible reminder of how they are to be li living their life. So not to make something else so urgent that you step out unclothed in the reality that you have embraced. And uh, so I don't, we don't want to look upon this in a legalistic kind of fashion, but I think it does tell us something about the nature of the habit. You know, I know there have been a lot of fights and debates about this over time, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, priests should be wearing the cassock or religious, their habit. But, you know, just to make it a legalistic kind of thing is, you know, makes it nonsensical. But I think to see it in the way that Ephraim is talking about here is that we're, one is putting on an identity and you, you cannot go out for a period of time as, as if you are something different. And, you know, I think priests at, at certain times, you know, will want to, you know, shed, to put off that priestly identity, you know, that it becomes something that they want to free themselves for a period of time and not have to carry it. Uh, and to be seen in that way. I remember being at Franciscan University. I was a younger priest at this point, but I was studying. And, you know, I had my habit on. And I tried to walk across the campus. And, you know, I had multiple people come up and ask for confession. It was a weird day. I mean, people had, like, things that they bought from the store running up and asking for, you know, me to bless them, like whole bags of stuff or their rosary or wanted to receive the sacrament. And it took me, like, 50, you know, 15 minutes just to walk from one building to, to another. But I think often... You know, for other reasons, you know, priests will want to set aside that identity and all that it means. And, you know, I'm sure that this is true for married couples, too, that the, the, the reality of the married life, the identity of that uh, can feel heavy at times where one would want to be free from it. And so Ephraim saying here, not for a moment. Like, even if you're stepping out the, the door and somebody's calling on you for something that's urgent, don't, you can't leave behind the identity, the reality that you've embraced. And for, as Christians in general, I think this is true. You know, we can't set aside our deeper identity as Christian men and women, uh, no matter what the world is calling us to do or to participate in or the, you know, seeming urgency that it has, you know, that there should always be this pace at which we enter into the life around us. And it always should be shaped, I think, by, in the way that Ephraim is talking about here, this waiting on the Lord for him to guide and direct us, not so that we can make a quick action or decision, but that we might be responding from this deeper level where we are guided by God and the light that he gives us and in his time. And the faster things become in our world, you know, that there is this tendency to want to move quickly uh, with the world around us. And uh, this can, you know, in, infiltrate the life of the church as a whole, even with evangelization and the use of sort of you know, technology, again, I'm not a Luddite, and I use technology all the time, but I think we, we can sort of want, 
or feel that we have to keep up with the world around us. And I think there are times when we have to purposely slow things down and listen to God. I've often brought up Cardinal Seurat's book, The Power of Silence. And it came out right at this perfect time. And I know a lot of people love the book, but I also feel that it wasn't given enough attention in the sense that, you know, here we are in a time of enormous change, scandal rocking the life of the church. What is our response as Christian men and women to be? Uh, and here he writes this book, The Power of Silence, to, to be silent to listen to God on this very deep level and allow him to guide us along the path forward. You know, our tendency is to try to fix things, to change things, to alter them, to make them better in our own judgment. Well, how do we know what's going to bear fruit for the life of the church? You know, we know how to wreck things pretty quickly. We, you know, we're pretty good at that, but to, to help be a source of healing, or to to do something that's going to bear fruit you know most often when we we take things into our own hands and think oh i got to do this this and this you know to build you know build up the kingdom of god you know there can be so much of ourself in that that you know we're we're guiding we're following our own light not necessarily the light that god has given giving us anthony Father, it seems there is a contradiction between these paragraphs of waiting on the Lord and the presumably bad example of Ionikios' mother in section B, who was content to labor with the other women, but not formally take the yoke of a nun. It looks like maybe people should have left her alone. Am I wrong here? Well, I think, you know, part of what was being said there is that you know, she was being guided by her son, who was seeing that this was, was, given her life and how she was living her life, that this was going to be something that was going to be fruitful for her spiritually. That what he was seeing going on, you know, and not only in her life, but in the life of these other women who were being called uh, to this particular form of life that she was holding back, maybe even from what in her own mind were virtuous reasons. Uh, so I don't think we want to look upon her harshly in any way. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's only, it's almost like Joseph in the gospel, you know, in a dream where she lets go of a kind of resistance to the idea of life, probably thinking, okay, I'm an older woman, you know, and I've lived this life for all this time. And, you know, the idea of embracing this life of greater commitment uh, doesn't seem necessary, or maybe it wouldn't be a good thing. And it's only in the dream that you know, the conscious resistance to that breaks down and uh, a, a truth is Co comprehended there and in through faith that then allows her to see the beauty of it and then desire it and you know in joseph we see the same thing you know he wears himself out because you know consciously and on a rational level he can't understand how to respond to this situation and mary is betrothed to god to the holy spirit is conceived and you know how is he supposed to respond to this as a righteous man uh, without mary being stoned to death you know is, is he to insert himself and take upon himself the role of father when he knows that there is this different reality or does he seek to uh remove himself from the equation similarly to john the baptist who doesn't want to baptize our lord you know, you should be baptizing me. Why, why are you coming to me and asking me to baptize you? And the Lord says to him, we do well to fulfill all that the Father demands. And so, you know, similarly, I think with uh, her, you know, with, uh, I'm sorry, I forget her name at the moment. Did you mention it here? Or is it? Hmm. 
I just called her Ioannikos' mother. Right. That, you know, it's only when she can sort of let go of that then that she has this kind of freedom. And I think that could be true for us as well. You know, that w there are certain things that can happen to our in our life that break down those kinds of resistance that we have on a spiritual or emotional level to res responding to the will of God in our life. Fear, anxiety, doubt, uh, our own past, you know, feelings of shame about all, all these different things can prevent us from responding to what God is calling us to do. And, uh, and so I think we're also given these kinds of examples to show us that. So I don't, I don't see the contradiction in there. I just see that something else is being communicated to us in and through that story. That here she was called to something great, but was hesitant, greater for her, but was hesitant to, to do it. Ashley writes, I was learning about biblical botany on Saturday from a friend. I don't hear people tell me that very often. I was learning about biblical botany from a friend, and this reminds me of the study of why the fig leaf is so important in the fall of Adam and Eve. The fig leaf excretes something that is very irritating to human skin. Oh, boy. So in their haste to remedy their shame and to hide what they, they've done to solve their own problem, they actually make it worse and cause themselves pain. And this God, this God gave them, anim, and thus God gave them animal skins to wear. I'd, to be honest, I had never heard that. <laughs> they got poison ivy from the, the figglies. <laughs> uh, it's a curious thing. You know, certainly, uh, I've never heard that, but it's consistent with what takes place. You know, they hide themselves from God. And, you know, they who would make themselves God then can't control their passions, feel, experience shame because of it, want to hide themselves. And as Ashley tells us here, you know, hiding themselves in their own fashion makes the circumstance worse the God then gives them, you know, something with which to clothe themselves. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, whenever we t take our own path, uh, you know, other than in obedience, the, the, the fruit of that is, is, is never good. And this can be true, uh, I, I think, within the religious life here. And this is what Ephraim has been telling us. You know, if you're willful in this, then you're really not acting in accord with the will of God. In humility, we have to allow ourselves to be guided, led. And that's often a difficult thing for us to do. Uh, from Abba Isaiah. Had our Lord Jesus Christ not first healed all the passions of mankind for whose sake he came into the world, he would not have ascended the cross. For before the Lord came into the world in the flesh, mankind was blind, dumb, paralyzed, and deaf, leprous, lame, and completely deadened by sin. But when he took pity on us and came into the world for our sake, he raised the dead, made the lame walk, the blind see, the dumb talk, the deaf hear, and lifted up mankind anew, delivered from every infirmity. And then he ascended the cross. They crucified two thieves with him. The one who was suspended on his right glorified him and begged him, remember me, O Lord, when the, when, in thy kingdom, while the other on the left blasphemed him. This account shows that before the spiritual mind is awakened, it is found in enmity. Only if our Lord Jesus Christ raises the mind from its negligence and gives it the capacity to see it again, and to discern all things, will be able to ascend the cross of self-denial. Now enmity, which blasphemes like the ungrateful thief, is manifested in harsh words, hoping that the mind might grow weary and relinquish the labor of asceticism, and thus return once more to negligence. This is the symbolic meaning of the two thieves, whom our Lord Jesus Christ separated from friendship with each other, and of whom the one mocked Jesus, waiting to see 
as I said previously, whether he could alleviate him from hope, whereas the other had the patience to beseech him until he heard the words, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. It was he who tasted of the tree of eternal life. So it's sort of a curious thing that Isaiah, Abba Isaiah is doing here, that you know, our Lord enters into and takes our humanity upon himself precisely to, to bring about a healing there of the passions that afflict us before ascending to the cross. You know, that he opens up this path of healing, not only to, to free us from what afflicts us, but to allow us then to imitate him and ascend that cross ourselves, to die to self and to sin in order to, to live for God, to enter into the Paschal mystery ourselves. So we don't have something just bestowed upon us in an impersonal fashion. But we are drawn into this relationship in the most intimate way. We are drawn into the Paschal mystery, the, the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so we enter into the ascetic life. We wait patiently in order then that we might offer ourselves completely to God in imitation of Christ. It's for this reason, too, that we receive the Holy Eucharist saying amen, that we might become what we receive and that we might imitate Christ in the way that we live our, our life and the way that we respond in love, that our love too might become cruciform, that we might, our ascetical life is all that we might ascend the cross, that we might love in this selfless fashion and imitation of Christ. So we're not entering into the ascetical life to find a kind of peace of mind or even a kind of free freedom from our self that we find so oppressive. We enter into the ascetical life in order that the, the, the life that Christ gives us and bestows upon us might bear the, the fullest fruit, that we might partic participate in the most intimate way in the redemptive work of the cross that we might ascend the cross, die to self and sin in, in order to live for God. And I think this escapes us so often as Christian men and women. Christianity is not self-help. You know, we, we don't enter, you know, we don't receive the sacraments. We don't enter into the ascetic life, the life of prayer in order to, in a sense, make our life easier in this world. And if anything, we, we've seen uh, that to engage in the ascetic life means being drawn into this spiritual battle, this spiritual warfare that becomes more intense. Uh, the, more, the closer that one draws to God, the more uh, violent the evil one's attacks become. And so, you know, all of these writers here don't want men or women to embrace the monastic life with, you know, in, with a kind of illusion uh, in order to embrace an illusion, the illusion of holiness by one's independent choice outside of that relationship with God. It has to be a response, amen, so be it and a response that comes out of a love and desire for God. Otherwise, it will bear no fruit. Again, it's a very sobering view of Christianity, unvarnished view of, of the gospel, but real. You know, there's no kind of prosperity gospel that can sort of creep into this. It's pretty hard to read the fathers and say, oh yeah, they're talking about, you know, if you just do this and your life will be, you'll be blessed. <laughs> so, any final comments, questions? All right, a lot to think about. 
and uh, the next hypothesis will even round it out even more for us. Okay. So why don't we close there for the night? As always, with our Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go Amen. On.